Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, has Republic of Gamers built a card so amazing for the Matrix GTX 580 Platinum that Ryan's actually excited about GPUs again? Gaming over 3G? Hmm. Our thoughts on the Steve HP's PC business? Xbox 360s? We say hack the cable. And speaking of hacks, how about some hot hackintosh action? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch this week in computer hardware episode 134, recorded August 25th, 2011. A GPU worth loving. This episode of This Big in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined, as always, by the man, the myth, the benchmarking legend, Mr. Ryan Shrout of PCPer.com. How's it going, man? Uh, not too bad. It's kind of, um, it's interesting. Last week, we were both in studio. We were both, uh, you know, got, we got to do a really interesting show. If you didn't watch the uh, video version of that show, I think we'd both highly recommend you checking it out. And then this week, we are both on the road again. Well, I guess technically I'm at home. You are on the road. <laughs> I am on the road. So we've gone Usually, from being together in the room to basically as far apart as we can get, as disjointed as possible. Oh, no. Oh, no. We can get much farther apart. There's an entire <laughs> planet with here I, i'm in denver you're in kentucky usually we're farther apart i'm in, usually in san francisco or, or true Columbia. true we should probably explain to folks who are new to the show this is twitch this week in computer hardware we talk about hardware we talk about the news we answer viewer questions we get all excited about it sometimes actually mm -hmm. once just last week uh ryan and i actually got to record in the same room in the twitch studio uh excuse me the twitch studio my apologies leo and co um which is actually really fun for us and uh it you was. guys have sent us some really cool emails so thank you so much for all the kind words on that um a lot of stuff going on this week uh hurricane irene mm -hmm. uh which my family actually uh is very close to you know a hurricane is serious my mom is packing up the family and mm -hmm. hall of for the other side of New Jersey. Um, so back up your data. And if you didn't back up your data yet, you probably should have. That uh, is a good Steve reminder. Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring the, if you can't bring the computer, just grab the hard drive. Trust me. <laughs> uh, big news this week. Uh, and it's actually, uh, people are getting really, really emotional about this, especially tech pundits, uh, is that Steve Jobs <laughs> is stepping down as the CEO of Apple. And, you know, we do cover, uh, you know, uh, uh, Macintosh OS 10 products here, but we're primarily a, a Windows kind of shop. We do a little bit of the open right. source. But less you, you think Steve is not having an influence, try to remember that there were millions, somewhere upwards of 7 to 10 million PCs with USB ports before the iMac was introduced uh, with several actual functioning peripherals and pretty much invented the USB peripheral market, or, or, or sort of snowballed the USB peripheral market uh, outside of mice and keyboards. Um, the iPod, of course, became synonymous with portable listening to music for the vast majority of the world, older, or at least the population of the United States. The iPhone, I think, indirectly spawned Google's Android operating system and a whole lot of open source movement there. Um, right. It, one of the interesting things was, you know, Walt Mossberg actually was getting pretty serious. One of the things he, I, I, there's a, there was a quote in there, and, and it is something I actually thought was worth noting, is, is whether you, you like Apple or hate Apple or think Apple is pretentious or silly. Um, but one of the things that, that Mossberg pointed out is, is that, um, you know, one, he was building amazing, doing his best to build amazing projects. And two, this is somebody who has never, ever, unlike the, the CEOs of far too many companies out there, beholden to, you know, basically make the numbers look good for the next quarter and we'll just shovel delete expletive uh, out into the market. Um, you know, and, and there's been some epic fails. Uh, and, and, you know, sure. from what I've heard, he's an unbelievably difficult human being to work with. Um, but it is, a, it is certainly something that has been all 
over the news uh, this week, and I thought we should probably. It was at least yeah, it was funny. I watched. I uh, somebody linked the first iPod commercial ever uh, on YouTube, and I remember I do remember seeing that when it was first came out, and it's it's almost comical to watch now how. Uh, innovative and different it was to drag music onto a portable music device. The right. tagline of a thousand songs in your pocket means basically nothing at this point. Uh, and it, you know, it was a big bulky kind of small brick type of device, but you're right. I, I do like that point there that not enough companies and CEOs have the, the guts to stand up against the shareholders and that kind of deal and say, you know, this is the way we're going to do things. And, and we're not just going to, do things the way that, that, that the marketer, marketeers want us to do and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't think we have to worry about Apple as a company going away. We don't have to worry about their products going away. Uh, if he's still involved with the company at all, uh, I think we'll be pretty good there. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, uh, worth mentioning, not a huge effect, I think, on, on the hardware side of things in terms of what we expect going forward, I guess. Who dat? One thing that has changed uh, this week, perhaps less, well, it's a significantly lower profile. Uh, almost impossible to find one of AMD's HD 6970s. Has it been end of life? Are they just short supplied right now? Or is this, you so, know, part of a larger plot to get inexpensive, overperforming graphics cards out of the hands of end users? <laughs> it's, yeah, hmm, no, I don't think so. That So it's, it's interesting. We, we, we had noticed this trend over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Josh Walworth, who actually posted the editorial at PC Perspective, talks about it. This is something we, had, you know, internally we had noticed a couple of times, and finally we had noticed it enough times in a row where we said, okay, there's something to this. Let's do a little research, ask some other companies. AMD refused to comment, but we did get some comments from some of their partners and that type of thing. And the issue that kept coming up was there's a shortage of supply of chips. There's a shortage of supply of chips. And if you look at, um, so that's the 60... 970. If you look at the 6990, which is basically a combination of two 6970 chips on, on a single card, you'll notice that those are almost impossible to find and have been forever. So it kind of makes sense. These two are very much related uh, products. So if, if, you, if you're having trouble making the single GPU cards that sell much, much better than the dual GPU cards, then you're obviously going to use them as much as you can on the single GPU cards. And then right. if you have some left over, you might make some of the 6990s. But the, you know, one of the reasons you can't find 6990s is kind of trickles down in the 6970. Ironically, the day we posted this story, which actually was yesterday, uh, a handful more showed up at Newegg. I think like four or five different SKUs showed up. Whereas when we actually published it the first time, there was only one SKU and there were eight or nine that were out of stock. So there's still, there are some in stock and they kind of are hit or miss right now. We're curious how long that's actually going to last. I don't think, so there's, there's, there's a couple of theories. One is all that Bitcoin mining that we've talked about over the last couple of months and how successful AMD GPUs are at it is probably one of the sources of people buying these cards up. Uh, the other one is that there are production problems with TSMC at 40, uh, 40 nanometers. There always have been. And these are just continuing and as the struggle between NVIDIA and AMD at that foundry increases, right? You know, they're competing for more resources. So, you know, production issues is another one. And also the idea is that they might be planning for something new. They have talked about Northern Islands coming out maybe before the end of the year. So maybe they guessed just a little bit incorrectly and are starting to run out of cards earlier than they had really wanted to. So the, we're not really sure on that. We're glad to see some more cards in stock today. Although if you're listening to this tomorrow, who knows, right? It, it's kind of one of those things. It's, it hasn't been very consistent. So if you're interested in a 6970, keep your um, eyes open for those when they go on sale. And if you're hesitant about it, you might lose it. The only, I guess the only kind of good news out of this is prices haven't really been affected by it. You know, they're not like charging 30, 40, 50 dollars more than MSRP for these cards just because they seem to be hard to get a hold of, which is, I don't know if that's uh, goodwill on the manufacturer, or goodwill on the add-in card vendor, or just like Newegg and Tiger Direct and those guys, or maybe they just don't notice. Nobody's noticed the trend. <laughs> yeah. So that's, Look. that's it was just kind of a little thing we noticed, and we're, we're going to keep an eye on a little bit closer now and see how much or if it blows up. Speaking of blowing up, uh, uh, I think irritating practices of all time. Intel has returned to one of the most irritating practices of all time, upgrade cards for crippled parts. 
I'm just going to read the lead graph. It has almost been a complete year since Intel decided to sell $50 upgrade cards for their processors. Ryan noted that the cost of upgrade between the two processors was just $15 at the time, which made the $35 premium over just outright purchasing the higher-end CPU seem quite ludicrous. Yeah. launched and expanded their initiative to include three SKUs. So... If you should happen to be shopping for a computer, Ryan and I would like you to go out and buy a better model of that processor elsewhere. Perhaps from a different get a bunch of extra money uh, that you shouldn't have had to have spent for it in the first place. Uh, yeah, I mean the <laughs> the idea the idea itself. I know when we talked about it last time on the show, drew a lot of both positive and negative feedback in terms of the idea. Obviously, the, the fact that the, the processes were $15 difference in prices, but you're paying $50 for that upgrade after the fact was a little bit irritating because of the percentage, you know, upsell basically on that. Um, this time around, if they're, if they're a little bit more uh, cost accurate, I'll say, does that change your opinion on whether or not this is a good offering? I mean, we one of the things that's interesting this time around is it's about notebooks, right? And we talk a lot about on the show that notebooks are significantly harder to upgrade. So is it worth paying a little bit of a premium to get a little extra speed after the fact? One of the things we discussed last night was, you know, Intel already does this when they sell you a, a retail part or, or they sell retail, you know, different SKUs to the OEMs, right? So they might downclock cores that can run faster in order to sell them for the lower price and not, you know, destroy their margin on the other parts, even though that CPU is capable of running at, I don't know, 2.3, they run it at 2.0 just right. because they have a buyer for 2.0, but they do not have a buyer for 2.3. So I should just I'm, get off I, my high horse about bin sorting? Well, no, I mean, it's, it's just like a necessary evil, right? Um, right. It's, you know, you don't want to, Intel doesn't want to give away free performance, even though obviously that's what we want. That's what enthusiasts want. That's what consumers want. They say, hey, if this part can run at 2.3 at the same power, let it run at 2.3. And Intel goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, how about for 50 bucks, we give it to you for 2.3. So it's, it's kind of like, for me, and my viewpoint has shifted a little, uh, shifted a little since we first discussed it, um, that I think it's not a huge deal as long as they're not ripping people off. It's not a bad feature to offer if they're not ripping people off. Yeah, I, 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 if they're not ripping people off, I think it's great. I mean, on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, props to Intel for figuring out a really clever way to generate some additional revenue. <laughs> <laughs> Just what they need, right? <laughs> Just what they need. Have uh, in the war chest. Deus so we did X, do. Actually. Oh yeah, yeah. Before uh, before we get to that, I do want to mention real quick um, the Asus Matrix GTX 580 card we reviewed. I just have to show oh, this off. I love this review because you were like, "This is actually a card I am actually excited about," without having to manufacture excitement about the best. G you were actually like, "This is a really cool piece of engineering." Yes, or at least exactly. It, you know, it is. No, it actually turned out to be that way. And it's, and, and you're right. If you read the first like paragraph of the article, I basically am plainly honest with people. And I say, look, it's really difficult for me to get excited about hardware these days because I see so much of it. I get to use all of it. Very few cards that come across my desk are very exciting unless it's like a new architecture. This is not a new architecture. Uh, this is the Asus GTX uh, 580 Matrix, Republic of Gamers Matrix Edition, which basically just means it's their super highest ultra end part. Um, Really, really good cooling, it's, dual dual 120 millimeter fans uh, that um, are actually, you know, they, they run much quieter, but are also cooling much more efficiently. I think the GPU will, mm -hmm. will run at 66 Celsius versus like 80 Celsius on the reference card. I mean, that's a pretty significant difference, and it's actually noticeably quieter too. You know, the board design is, is built in a way that it's more um, friendly for overclocking. You know, it's better PCB design, solid state um, capacitors, and those types of things. It has interesting little features like the top of it here. It's might hard to see in the video where it says matrix. That's actually an LED light that changes from green to blue to red you know, as the load on the GPU increases. So you get like a little indication of what's going on there. And that might help if you um, get that Bitcoin virus, the coin mining virus on there. If you suddenly look down and you're not playing a game and your GPU logo up there is red, you might know something's going on. It has uh, 
a button. It has three buttons on the corner, which is obviously only useful for consumers that have open air test beds. And it has a 100% <laughs> fan button. So if you push that, the fans run 100% all the time. And it has plus and minus buttons, which are not for the core frequency, which I think is, I think is what they should have been, but they're for voltage adjustments. Mm -hmm. So you can oh, adjust the voltage on the on the GPU core up and down based on that. So it's a really cool piece of engineering. It's only about fifty or sixty dollars more than a reference GTX 580. Uh, so that's that's a noticeable amount. But if you're paying, if you're looking for the highest end single GPU graphics card anyway, uh, sixty dollars. You know, so you're going from five from four sixty to five twenty. So it doesn't seem like as big a jump then when you talk about it. Here's the downside to the card, and it's a, it's a little bit kind of bothersome to me. The the out of box overclock on this card is only 44 megahertz. It goes from 772 to 816, I believe, is 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 the overclock. The GPU is capable of way more than that. We I got it up to 975 megahertz or 950 megahertz, really without blinking an eye, only using the included ASUS software. So that it, it's capable of much more. But in order to 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 bend the processors or to bend the GPUs in a way um, that you know they could sell a lot of these and, and be contained within the power requirements they need to be in order to sell at the default settings, they they kept the the reference their reference clock to 816, even though I think hitting 875 or 900 probably would have been a pretty easy step for them. So right. it's kind of one of those things if you're not going to overclock, even with software, don't buy this card. <laughs> but if you want to overclock, and I think if you're looking at a GTX 580 or, or even like a you know, highly engineered GTX 580, I guess I'll say, then overclocking is probably what you're going to do. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, do you think it is a downside that they would not increase the performance out of the box? Or do you think anybody that's going to buy a card like this is going to do that themselves anyway? Anybody who's going to buy that card and finds the plus and minus buttons and and figure you know and goes through the manual and RTFMs and and figures out that they're for the voltage right. and not for the clock speed, I'm pretty sure they're going to, you know, overclock on their own. I, I wonder if they're worried about you know going back to pin sorting. If they're worried about variations, like if if they didn't feel like you get enough parts to overclock to a particular level. Or on some level, maybe yeah. I think they just wanted end users do it themselves. I thought it was kind of funny because I, I, voltage, I do think, seemed odd. But even better, it would have been both voltage and uh, frequency. Probably would get really messy really quickly. Probably. And uh, just before before we move on to the next thing, there was another. There's a, there's a, a review of a card that's going to go up. If you're if you've downloaded this and you're watching it. Uh, this review is already live. If you're watching this live, the review won't be up until midnight Eastern time. Um, so this was, this is the matrix, right? This is a GTX 580 matrix. I want you to see this just for reference. And then the card that will be reviewed later tonight is this. And uh, it's significantly larger than any graphics card we've ever tested before. <laughs> And uh, it's a dual GPU, dual GTX 580 card. So it's two of these GPUs in one card. It's really hard for me to get that in the frame right there. Um, so this, I can't really talk about it much anyway. It's a dual GTX 580 card. They've already shown it. They showed it at Computex and that kind of thing. Uh, but we're going to have benchmark numbers, power consumption numbers you're going to want to see for a card like this. And, uh, yeah, a lot of other interesting things about this card. I mean, look at the look at the size of the of the, where the bracket stops and the card just keeps going over it. It's when you first impressive. held it up, I thought it was a, 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 a uh, like a micro, a mini AT, or excuse me, a mini ITX. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a really cool GPU. It's not like a mini server. I'm confused. Um, it is two GPUs rated about 600 watts. So be prepared for that. <laughs> that is a lot of wattage. I, we have, uh, uh, there's three, three stores I think are um, and I'm just going to say, think about PC gaming, think about the change, the, the sort of terminal chase for more expensive hardware, the sort of crisis effect, can we build a game that cripples not only this mm. year's uh, GPUs, uh, but next year's. Um, you guys did a really good write-up from the Hard OCB, Hard OCB preview of Deus Ex, where they talk about... Um, Performance on cards costing less than two hundred fifty dollars, actually looking gorgeous, and I was thinking that, about that a lot uh, 
because you know HP is trying to sell its PC business. Samsung's vehemently denying that they're interested in buying the world's largest PC business. Uh, right. Billion last quarter, which is a huge amount of money. And I know you know Intel's making money hand over fist selling CPUs. But what's happening to the PC business, or is it just much more stable than it sounds like based on the stories this week? And so I, 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 the reason I also bring up gaming is I also I also think sometimes PC gamers get sh kind of short shrifted uh, because of the chase for better hardware. It's interesting. This this battle has actually gone back for a long time, right? If you look at you look at Dell and you look at let's look at Intel's primary partners, Dell, uh, Compaq back in the day, HP now, Acer. You know these these guys are buying tons and tons and tons and tons of stuff from Intel. Intel's making right. three plus billion dollars a quarter. They have really, really good uh, margins on that. You know, they're talking 40% or above margins on income. You look at Dell, wouldn't they love to have 40% margins on anything that they're doing other except like the super high end enterprise stuff? It, it's one of those arguments that PC yeah. builders have always had of, hey, Intel, it's time. You know, you, you can't survive without us. Right, you you don't sell anything. You don't sell very much directly to the consumer, right? DIYers aren't a big percentage of stuff. You you wouldn't survive without us. We were struggling. This is back when, you know, Dell was really struggling, and, and the Compaq HP merger before all that happened. People really wanted Intel to kind of feed some of that goodwill back down the pipeline. It never really happened. The business kind of caught up. PCs were slightly profitable again. The mobile, the fact that people were buying notebooks again, notebooks had much higher margins than desktops did. But now notebooks are so saturated that the margins on those have come back down and we're kind of come full circle again where, you know, one and two percent margins is what these guys are dealing with. Um, and I think it's interesting. And if you look at what, you know, who was it? Uh, who bought Alienware? Dell bought Alienware. HP bought Voodoo PC. And the reasons they, they wanted to do this is PC gaming was much higher margin than just your basic PC sale. So right. I think they were hoping that these PC gamers would, would continue to elevate, that they would, they would start to look at buying these higher margin Alienware, higher margin Voodoo PCs. Uh, and this would help you know, uh, buoy their, their, their PC business, keep those margins high, keep development costs down because you, you know, you, you migrate stuff from the high end gaming machines down to your basic consumer PCs, you know, you're eating a lot of the development money R and D on that. And I don't think it really happened because PC gaming has slowly, you know, been declining while consoles have increased. So, you know, that go back to your original point here with Deus Ex, you know, with a $250 video card, you could max out basically any setting even at, you know, the 30-inch monitor level almost, um, which disappoints enthusiasts, dis disappoints people who want a reason, I guess, who, who are itching for a reason to spend money on, on PC hardware. But it's for people who don't want to spend money, this is what they want, which, you know, we always have that debate of the console users versus the PC users and ports and et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's, it's, it's just, I, the, it was just so weird seeing the, the, you know, the Acer losing seven billion a quarter. That's, that's big money. That's, that's um, a lot. You know, yeah, you know, and it's funny. The, the Samsung, uh, basically, you know, Samsung went out of their way. Uh, All things D was writing about this. Uh, uh, you know, we're <laughs> with the most excellent use of a do not want cat. But you know, the, basically, they, they went. The, the vice chairman. Um, uh, basically put out a statement to put to rest any speculation on this issue. I would like to definitively state that Samsung Electronics will not acquire Hewlett Packard's PC business, uh, in part because you know, Hewlett Packard is the global leader in the PC business with sales of 40 million units last year, while Samsung is an emerging player in the category and sold about 10 million units in 2010. Based on wow. the significant disparity of scale in with Samsung's own PC business and the complete lack of synergies, it would be both infeasible and imprudent to even consider such an acquisition. And it's it's funny because you know we heard uh, at CES this year we we heard uh, Nvidia making a big, big deal, basically saying it's all about the ARM process. You know, buggy whips. It's it's to, to borrow a line from Neil Gaiman. You know, it's, it's by the uh, way, well, uh, I think. I think we should point out TechCrunch corrected their story to say Acer lost almost 250 million last oh. quarter alone. Uh, and the reason, wow, that's really dumb. Uh, it was 7 billion Taiwan dollars, new Taiwan dollars. <laughs> okay. 
Well, I, I feel much less concerned about Acer than I did just a few months Cause like ago. Because I was saying a $7 billion loss, that's... That's that's like a lot of their money forever. <laughs> I I feel much better now. Yes. Okay. Two hundred fifty. <laughs> they updated a title, but the URL is still almost seven billion dollars last quarter. But so, HP is still divesting, and, and there's interesting sort of internal. They still are, yes. Why HP is getting rid of the PC business? But that yep. is my my fear and uncertainty and doubt mongering for the week. Uh, I noticed that uh, none of us actually has stopped using PCs in our home. Um, no. Or work, um, although I am uh, currently on a Macintosh device at the moment. There is a PC in a notebook bag near me. I have both um, on, right? So <laughs> You've got like 23 computers within arm's reach of you right now. <laughs> Pretty close. We should take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. Who do we thank for the show this week, Ryan? So uh, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is, of course, brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. No more going back to video stores, anything like that, or even waiting for DVDs to come to you in the mail from whatever service you might have for there. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies, streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch uh, movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or even your iPad with the new iPad app. You can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones as well. You can have a game, if you have a gaming console like a 360, PS3, or even a Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV that way. And even, even if you're not a gamer, there are still devices that will help you do that, like the Roku box for the Apple TV. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of those devices, and you can begin, watch a, begin watching a movie or show anything that's on Netflix streaming on one device and finish it on a different one. It keeps track of where you stop playing, which is actually really cool. You can be, um, whichever way you decide to actually access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and as TV shows as you want, as many times as you want. If you're like Patrick and you like to rewatch things, <laughs> not going to be charged extra for that. You want to get all the details. No, no extra charges as many times as you want to want. And you can cancel at any time if for whatever reason you don't like the service. Try Netflix today for 30 days completely free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use that URL when you sign up for the free trial, please. Netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. You want to get I to know. some emails now? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Greg says he's got an old PC tower laying around, and he's thinking about building his own Hackintosh for some time. He says he's recently purchased a copy of the Snow Leopard box set that comes with iLife and iWork. He's now working on a list of hardware he thinks would work. So far on the list, I have an Intel Core i3-2100 Sandy Bridge 3.1 gigahertz dual-core processor with a Gigabyte GA Z68A D3HBX ATX motherboard along with a Galaxy GeForce GT430 video card. He's going to be doing some light design work and photo editing, but mostly everyday tasks, web surfing, and light gaming. Minecraft. Page and feel that these components would be a good starting point with room to upgrade in the future, but wanted to get your thoughts and opinions first. Any suggestions? Thanks, guys. Awesome show, and keep on keeping on. We will do our best, Greg. Um, if you have not seen it, uh, 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 my, my, uh, my, my producer and, and partner in crime on Techzilla, um, along with Veronica and, 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 and uh, Robert and Serafina, is uh, Roger Chang, and he started talking about doing a Hackintosh build, which got kind of an insane response from the audience so he is in the process of building one and he introduced me to tony mac x86 dot com and if you go up to the tony mac x86 dot com along with a strange picture of a fruit that looks much like an apple but is slightly different on the left side you'll see the custom mac builds under resources and hmm. uh, i highly recommend you spend some quality time on this web page um, if you're thinking about building a system because basically um, you know they're they're working with the sort of iBoot multi beast. Um, they they are basically making trying to make this a fairly painless process. Uh, you know, if you're, uh, it is a it, I want to say it is an LGA eleven fifty five motherboard from Gigabyte. Um, but when you're building a Hackintosh, I think it behooves you to stick as close to the list of parts that other people have made work as possible. <laughs> yes, um, um, because these things either work really well or they cause you emotional trauma and suffering. And for some reason, I have concerns that whether or not a core i3 would work. 
Um, I think, so he's using a discrete graphics card. I think the Core i3 should work just fine. Uh, Sandy Bridge architectures should be an issue, I don't think. Um, I th looking over his general hardware specs, they seem pretty safe. The only thing, the Z68 chipset might worry me a little bit. I know that the, that right. uh, they have a lot. I've had success with P67 and H67 motherboards on these types of things, but I, you know, you can check around and see if Z68 is similar enough to that that it shouldn't cause an issue. I mean, it has, it's basically the same chip set, chip set with some extra features. So if you don't plan on using those extra features, it might not be an issue. Um, he, the only other thing I would say it's is he, he funny. Wants, one that's, I was going to say, he's got one that's pretty close. I think he may actually have one that's pretty close to one of the recommended motherboards from uh, oh, okay. from Tony Mac. So the Z6, in that case, the Z60 would work. In fact, let me cut and paste and see if that comes even close there. Um, uh, so this, he's got the UD2H versus the D3. Okay. Um, man, it should be. Well, it sounds like Z68 will definitely work. Okay. Um, I mean... That's the thing is if you're if you're getting prepared for just be prepared for some things to not work right if you want firewire support like if you're if you need something specific like that then you need to those are the things you need to triple check that the chip on that motherboard is compatible right because even though it uses the same z sixty eight chipset the firewire controller is going to be different uh, motherboard to motherboard. The only other thing I would say is he he asks about um, being able to upgrade down the road, and I would never plan on doing that with uh, a Hackintosh, because that all depends on what hardware Apple wants to put in their system down the road, and if they will add support for that hardware into the uh, the operating system, essentially. I mean, in, in memories, hard drives, possibly GPUs. Memory and hard drives yeah. would definitely upgrade. Uh, GPUs, we hope you'll be able to upgrade. I haven't, you know, gosh, I haven't really tried that. Um, mm -mm. No, I have not either. Roger, I'm going to wait till Roger builds his Hackintosh. Then there I'll you go. A new GPU and it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got an update from Mark who sent us an email. Maybe it was two weeks ago. I think, uh, remember, he accidentally pulled the processor out of the motherboard socket while the motherboard clamp was still down when he was trying to take off the heat sink and uh, wouldn't boot anymore. And he couldn't find out if it was a motherboard or processor and didn't know what he would expect. So he sent us an update. He says, I sent my motherboard back to ASUS and it checked out fine. I got a new CPU from AMD though. After putting everything together with the new CPU, it all works. There are mm. hardware status LEDs on the MOBO to tell if there is a problem in the boot process or the boot sequence. With the old CPU and bent pins, it wouldn't get past the CPU LED. With the new CPU, all the LEDs blinked in sequence as each component passed a self-test. So it seems like it was the CPU. I guess CPUs are more fragile these days. Anyway, just wanted to say I like the show and thanks for answering my question. That's good news. So it sounds like uh, AMD even replaced his processor for free, which is pretty nice of them. That's pretty awesome. Um, it's always nice also when your motherboard isn't dead after a, after a CPU glitch. Um, I don't know if CPUs are that much more fragile. I, I think just sometimes you get lucky and short out yeah. the pins. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. interesting. A AMD is still using the in the, in the consumer line, processors with pens. Remember, Intel Intel's processors don't have pens on them anymore. They have the pads, and the right. pens actually exist on the motherboard itself. And the motherboard manufacturers, I remember when this was first happening, were really upset about it because it, it's gonna. It would, they knew it was gonna spike up their RMA rates, their right. you know, troubleshooting and 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 return rates and that kind of stuff, while it was lowering Intel's. Just another way, Intel, maybe not on purpose, probably on purpose figure out a way to pass on some of the costs of doing business to their, to their partners <laughs> uh, than necessarily doing it themselves. So, M's that got the gold makes the rules, right? Exactly. Rule, exactly. Cruel lesson taught by history. Also a cruel lesson taught by history, Xbox cables are designed to make you pay more money and suffer. Pete uh, <laughs> wants to say that last week's episode, number 133, was excellent. I wish Ryan and Patrick could always find handy reasons to make it up to the brick twit house on each Twitch day. I love that despite the amazing set cameras and switching, it doesn't get overproduced. The relaxed atmosphere and Leo wandering in to talk about the spy satellite <laughs> perspective camera make it feel like a really interesting conversation more than anything else. And I think that's actually kind of our goal is to, to have something you'd like to be hanging out with and listening yeah. to. And, and participating in. Um, I'd also like to point out, for people who don't realize it, that was actually, 
I guess that was we had, we had met at CES, but that was the first time we've ever actually had a chance to do a, a Twitch at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was. Just, see, it was, see how well we got along. No fighting or anything like that. It was nice. Yeah, well, they sedated us before. <laughs> <laughs> Pete has a quick question. He says, uh, and, and we also say thank you for the kind words, Pete. And everybody mm -hmm. else who put in, that was pretty cool of you. Pete says, uh, I want to use my brand new Xbox 360 with a Dell monitor and headphones. I have the HDMI and composite cables that came with the system, plus an HDMI to DVI converter and an old hi-fi amp I already own. But the analog cable has been engineered to block the HDMI port. Curses! I found videos on YouTube of people hacking off the bottom of the analog plug to allow them both to work concurrently, but I am concerned that doing so could harm something, something in the long run. Do I try the free hack and risk my Xbox, or can you recommend another way to split analog audio out of HDMI without buying a new costly amp head? Yes, you could buy a new costly HDTV, which will allow you to take the analog out of the back. <laughs> you could buy a new costly uh, AV receiver. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I guess mm -hmm. the amp head would be the AV receiver. Um, I would just hack it. Um, I could have sworn they had like a $50... Uh, HDMI cable uh, that was basically a, a specific cable engineered to work around the HDMI cable in the newer Xbox 360s. I could be wrong. Um, the uh, mm. I, I'd be honest with you. If, you, if it were me, I'd get out my Dremel tool or I would get out, you know, the X-Acto knife or the file or whatever and just very gently, you know, do what people are showing you on Instructables and other places in YouTube and just crack it open, cover the metal bits with, with you know, tape or if you're feeling fancy shrink wrap tubing and just make it work <laughs> you know this is one of those this is one of those hacks where it's it's pretty much completely passive right so i mean the worst thing that can happen is you break your cable and you have to buy a new one you're not i don't think you're going to harm the 360 you might harm your no. wallet a little bit because no. xbox cables aren't usually cheap but uh, i don't think you're going to break anything yeah, I mean, unless you actually manage to, like, you know, carve a hole through the wires on the inside. And then, you know what I mean? Like, you have to do a lot of damage to the cable to do something that could be potentially Fox 360. And a lot of people are doing this. Pete, go for it. Get your file out. Get your, get your Dremel tool. If you don't have a Dremel tool, this is a wonderful reason to buy a Dremel tool, which you'll find a thousand uses for. Um, but, yeah, I would, I, you know. You know, check out check out the cables that are being offered, but I would just freaking cut the case off and make the space for it to fit because it's an irritating thing when they block a port on the machine. We have an email from Jay about upgrading an HD 5770. He says, I love your show and keenly look forward to it every week. I like that. I like that. He keenly looks for it. That's good. Uh, I had a question. I custom built my PC about two years back when the ATI 5000 series cards came out. He's a Core i7-920. Asus P6T motherboard rated on HD 5770, obviously. I specifically chose the 5770 because of its low power consumption. Now, I find that some of the games I play are struggling a bit, so I wish to upgrade the graphics processing power of this PC. I use two monitors at 1280 by 1024 each and wish to retain the current 5770 card. What are my options? By adding a second 5770 in Crossfire, would I lose dual video output? Well, Jay, um... No, if you if you add another 5770 to your system, you'll get Crossfire. You'll get scaling anywhere from 30% um, to 75%, depending on the game. You do not lose the capability to do dual video output of, uh, in any in any case. Um, if you're running Crossfire, you can only use the outputs from one card, which if you've already got two monitors hooked up to your 50, to your 5770, you don't have to worry about that, right? So. The only thing that's kind of a bummer there is you can't use the display outputs on the secondary card once it's configured in Crossfire. If you weren't using Crossfire, you could use all the display outputs on all of the cards in your system. But whenever you're using multi-GPU rendering, you're kind of limited to the outputs on one card. Um, another option other than that would be obviously to move up to the 6000 series. I think, um, you could, I think looking at a 6850 or 6870 would be a good option. They're going to be a little bit, use a little bit more power. Um, and maybe, I don't know what 5770 you have, there's a big variance there, but it could be the same, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more in terms of noise levels as well. But I think like if you get a 6870, um, you're going to see a pretty dramatic increase in performance over the 5770. And I think even over the 5770s in Crossfire, you can get a 6870s for around, um, looks like 
$189, $179 and that kind of stuff. Uh, some looks like a couple of them are come with free games, free copy of Shogun, free copy of Dirt 3, something like that. So that's another option I would look at that's kind of in a similar budget. I don't even know. Let me let me double check here on the 5770s. <laughs> There's about $120, $140. So we're not paying much more to move up to a 6870. So, um, yeah, th I mean, those, those are a couple of options I keep in mind. And the 6870s will completely support the same two displays, uh, and they'll support three displays just like the, five, the 5000 series did as well. So if you're looking for a couple of recommendations, there you go. There you have. <laughs> Scott's got an email about a home. Well, basically, if you're thinking about building a free NAS, Scott says, thanks for the recommendations and research. But after finding a Twitter response on Pound Free NAS, I found a recommendation for the HP N36L, which bears a distinct resemblance. Uh, it looks like a cousin to one of the, uh, uh, to the Windows Home Server boxes. A distant cousin, yeah. mind you, but a cousin nonetheless. <laughs> he says, this is exactly, Scott says, what I was looking for. A small box I could fill with large, cheap drives from Central Computer. Viva la ZFS! Which is an awesome, 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 awesome thing to be able to do. The N36L is very quiet. Works great with FreeNAS 8. Does not come with a CD-ROM, but it does have an ESATA port in the back, so no NAS expansion, or excuse me, so NAS or network attack storage expansion should be very easy. Yeah, actually, uh, that's like the one thing I like about eSATA is inexpensive external drive cages where you can plug uh, several um, SATA hard drives into it and then plug yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the trick, though, in that case is like making sure that the external NAS box or the, or the, the expansion box, the eSATA expansion box, never gets moved and no one ever touches the cable. The cable things happen to uh, raid arrays. And it, I should also point out that I do not hate RAID. We got a really great uh, email. Um, oh, right. They're not going to be able to get to the show. But motherboard, I absolutely despise. But there are many flavors of RAID I think are freaking fabulous and belong in your home or corporate environment. So less people think I am completely hating on the RAID. Uh, I am not. <laughs> uh, but uh, Scott says, by the way, FreeNAS 8 has been great. With a little tweaking, I am getting 80 megabytes per second write throughput on a RAID Z1 and over 100 megabytes per second read throughput. That is pretty awesome. Thank you. For yeah, and I don't know if you noticed that, that this case is actually a system. Yeah. Right, I mean, for it's so a, it's three, it's three hundred twenty-nine bucks. Two. Yeah, Athlon Two Neo. So it's it's like Atom level type performance, maybe a little bit above Atom level performance. So nothing super exciting there, uh, but for you know running RAID essentially as its only job and network transfer, it's obviously more than capable of it. If he's saying he's getting eighty megs per second, one hundred megs per second in different instances, you know, one yeah. gig of memory. Uh, in a, a 1.3 gigahertz Athlon 2 Neo processor in this kind of handy little chassis design as well for 329 bucks is a pretty good starting point for people who want to build their own NAS, but they don't necessarily want to just take a beige box, find some motherboard that they hope still works, they have in their closet and those types of things as well. So this is one of the it's, questions we get a lot about, you know, I want to build a, my own NAS. This is a good place to start. Yeah, I, I would thought it was kind of interesting that it even comes with a 160 gigabyte hard drive on board. Um, so you basically oh, really? have the, the foundation. According to the specs, I was reading through the specs because okay. so I was trying to figure out actually how many hard drives it supports um, inside. Um, but that's an interesting box and cheap too, actually. Um, considering yeah. my Core i5, you know, rendering machine build rapidly spiraled out of control. I guess we sale from our friends at Central Computer. The pain adds up. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you want to talk about Hunter's uh, 3G question? Absolutely. Um, Connor wants to, he says he's started hosting LAN parties recently, which is awesome. Good for you, buddy. We like to see PC gaming growing again. And he, but he has encountered a problem. He says he hosts his own LAN parties at a local hall that my church owns, and we use a gigabit switch and router that's DHCP capable so we don't have to set IP addresses. For my most recent LAN, I set up a Samba file server on an old computer with an Ethernet card I brought as we were throwing flash drives at each other across the hall. That can be dangerous. <laughs> but file sharing, file sharing is no longer a problem. Uh, but getting internet access is. There are no internet connections in the hall, so we are all reduced to playing offline. Is there any way I can use my file server to become a hotspot giving internet 
to everyone else of the land using some sort of 3G. Thanks for making an awesome podcast and keep up the great work. Um, so your first, you had a comment here at the bottom. This is internet connection sharing, but ping times on 3G plus low bandwidth equals horrendous gaming experience. And I would tend yeah. to agree. Yeah, I'm kind of laughing because I'm literally, um, there are three uh, 4G wireless uh, hotspots within uh, a few steps of me right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one from T-Mobile, one from Verizon, one from Sprint. And uh, yeah, the, the, it's, it, words with friends, great over, o over uh, you know, mm -hmm. 3G or 4G. Um, you know, anything that involves any kind of twitch action or speed, uh, uh, you are going to get absolutely crushed because the latencies, you know, I, I was looking at like a 12 millisecond ping time um, over the the internet uh, offered by the hotel that I'm in right mm -hmm. now versus a 400 millisecond ping time over uh, Sprint yep. 3G. Um, and 400 milliseconds doesn't sound like a lot until you're trying to shoot someone in a game. <laughs> <laughs> and then it is a very, very long time. You know, if you just wanted to yeah. be able to do, you know, email or, you know, IM or basic stuff like that while you were gaming, yeah, the 3G modem would work fine. There's a bunch of different ways to share it. Most of the hotspots are, are, are limited to about five clients. But you could connect a computer, then do internet connection sharing. Um, if you do do that, especially if you are paying for the 3G connection, watch yourself um, on overage charges. Um, T-Mobile will basically th uh, throttle you down, uh, which they don't cut you off, but you're not going to be getting, you're not going to be like downloading large files. You basically, once you hit the cap, they have the ability to, to throttle your, to your file, uh, your, your download performance, right? Um, for most of the rest of, of the vendors, Sprint, for example, part of the reason I, I went with Sprint's 4G, um, it does not have the blazing speed of Verizon, uh, but it also does not have Verizon's caps. There's no cap on Sprint 4G. Verizon, once you hit the cap, they're like, yeah, how about 10 bucks a gigabyte after you nuke our <laughs> So, um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure AT&T does, does the same thing. So um, ping times won't work for gaming. You can share it by using internet connection sharing, or if you can find, there are still actually uh, some different uh, manufacturers making small boxes um, that are designed to connect to USB thumbsticks, although at this point I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the new hotspots because they have uh, the connectivity built in. You know, connecting right. it to 3G would get a little uglier, but basically start learning about internet connection sharing. Uh, unless you're running, that would be like the Windows version of it. If you're running it in Linux, um, build a smooth wall. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a this is one of the you know this is one of the things that can happen when PC game developers take things like that running being able to run dedicated uh, servers out of their games right so you, you don't have that capability to game LAN only on a lot of titles anymore um, which which is kind of a disappointment that's what I grew up on that's what I knew of you didn't have to be on the internet obviously uh, right. to, to to play games against people on a LAN which is kind of disappointing because you know you go to LAN parties like I was at QuakeCon. You still have to play online if you want to play StarCraft II, if you want to play uh, any of the, uh, um, the kind of three-quarter isometric games, um, the dungeon hunting games and those types of things. That, you know, they all require an internet connection of some kind, even if only to kind of like ping in and, and say, yes, we're ready to play. So hopefully we, I don't, I don't think we'll see a return to that. I think they're counting on more people having high-speed internet access than not. So uh, maybe another recommendation, find somebody nearby that has internet and buy a 200 foot ethernet cable <laughs> borrow can i borrow a cup of internet I, yes I think, ask I, first but yes <laughs> yeah i think pc uh, i think pc game members excuse me pc game makers would prefer to have you log in each and every single time you try to touch their game absolutely uh, <laughs> um, should we should we do one more gpu upgrade or should we hold that for next week uh let, this will be simple i think we can do this one let's uh We'll answer Matt's question before we go. <laughs> Matt said, I'm getting a new video card soon. I'm replacing an EVGA GTX 260, but with so many options out there, I'm getting a little overwhelmed. Matt, I know how you feel. <laughs> First, my processor, AMD 965 Black, 125 watts, running at a stock 3.2 gigahertz. RAM, 8 gigs of G-Skill, 1600 megahertz, probably running at 1333 due to the processor. GPU, EVGA GTX 260, PSU, Thermal Take 700 watt, MOBO, a Gigabyte AM3 Plus AM3 board with one PCI 16X, SLI with 16X, 8X, 
our uh, operating system Windows 7 64-bit. So now I get to my options. I've been trying to decide between Radeon and NVIDIA. I've read that NVIDIA is better for physics and DX11 tessellation, so I ruled out Radeon. If I absolutely needed to, I could spend between 300 and 350, but I'd rather not spend that much if the performance gain isn't noticeable or likely to last me longer. I'm trying to decide if buying a GTX 560 or 570 is the better option. If buying a 560, I could save about 100 bucks in SLI later if I wanted, but if 570 would get me better frame rates and higher settings, then maybe the $100 is worth it. Furthermore, I'm not sure if the 570 is appropriate given my older processor. Without making this any longer, here's where I'm getting stuck. When I look at the specs for either the 560 or the 570, I've noticed the 570 has more processor cores, roughly 100. But the core shader memory clocks in the 560 are all higher. Why is this? Will the extra 200, excuse me, will the extra 100 processor cores make a huge difference? And three, what performance hit does a 16x 8x SLI suffer over a 16x 60x SLI? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of, there's a lot in there. First thing I will say. He read that NVIDIA is better for physics and DX11 tessellation, so I wrote out Radeon. That's not a good way to cut off 50% of your choices, but if, if you're going to do that anyway, it kind of helps limit what your options are if he was talking about being overwhelmed with the options. So PhysX, P-H-Y-S-X, is a custom NVIDIA-owned uh, physics API that will be accelerated on GPUs. I think Batman Arkham Asylum used it. Batman Arkham City is going to use it. Not a whole lot of games really require it's like, it. It's like there's like a game that uses it. Yeah, there, there, there aren't any games that require it, and the games will only look a little bit better with it. It's kind of it's a whole big controversy we're not going to get into now. Uh, and DX11 tessellation, yes, NVIDIA does do uh, DX11 tessellation, tessellation faster than AMD, but AMD is more than capable of doing it just fine when Crisis isn't screwing it up. So back to his question about the 560 or the 570. So he noticed that the 570 has 100 uh, stream processors, 100 CUDA cores more than the 560, but the clocks in the 560s are higher. This does make sense if, if you think about the architectures are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And when you design a GPU or a, pro, a, a primary CPU as well, um, the more complexity you have in the chip, the, in general, the lower the clock speed you have to run it at in order to maintain stability and maintain under certain power consumption numbers and those types of things. If you take out some of those processor cores, you decrease the complexity, you can design a new chip that can run at higher frequencies. And that's what they've done with the 560 and the 570. So the 570 was going to run at slightly lower clock speeds, but it's extra 100 shaders will make up for that difference. And that's why the 570 is better at gaming than the 560. There were some cases where super overclocked 560s um, were actually performing as well as or better than the reference GTX 570s. Uh, those cards are really, really hard to find now. They were kind of only released right at the, the beginning of the 560s lifespan. Um, so I, I think either of those cards is going to do very well and be an upgrade for your GTX 260. I'd lean towards the 570. Uh, if I were you, if you're in that safety budget of three to three fifty, and I don't think you have to worry about what the five sixties clock speeds are versus anything. Um, most of the time, I don't want to say all the time, but most of the time, these graphics card companies want to keep things simple. That's why they have these obnoxious numbering systems, 550, 560, 570, 580, 590. In general, you walk up that ladder and you know you you increase your cost, you increase your gaming performance. There are very few instances where things get tripped up in between. And that's because you've got the 560 SI and the 560 TI and the 560 regular and all these types of things. But all that out of the way, I would say go with the 570 or uh, if you're trying to save a little bit of money, the 560 is going to be just as good. Uh, and I don't worry about your, your, your processor will be able to keep up um, I was for, about for to these ask types you. of games. Is he outclassing his processor at this point? But you say no. I don't think he's outclassing it. Uh, if you buy a 570, you'll be able to take that graphics card with you to your next system. You know, if you want to upgrade next year, type of thing. So, yeah, it, I, I'm pretty easy about that, right? I, I always take them in the, <laughs> the the sentiment of over purchase now if it's not going to hurt you financially, because you can always take that with you if, if you're going to change things anyway. So. It is an excellent plan, sir. I hope that simplified things a little bit for you, Matthew. Answer a lot of questions I had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, what's coming up on PC Per this week, Ryan? So I already previewed this enormous, just beast of a graphics card that kind of looks like a 
brick or a masonry item of some kind. Uh, that is what we have coming up plan. We actually have, in the, like I kind of previewed in the article that we talked about the Matrix review, we had the Matrix review just launch. We have uh, this Mars 2 review is going to launch, and then another GTX 580, like super overclocked model as well, coming up either Friday or Monday. So a lot of graphics cards kind of coming up on us as we kind of hit the apex or just over the apex of this generation of GPUs. You're going to start to see... You know, the custom designs, the, 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 the finished products of all this time, these companies have had to work on that type of stuff. So it'll, it'll be pretty interesting there. Um, and how about follow-up on Techzilla HD Nation? Actually, What's going on there? you just made me think to myself, is this going to be sort of the last major evolution in GPUs between now and the holiday shopping season? Um, I don't think so. I think between now and December, we'll probably see the release of a couple of new graphics cards, like maybe a new generation from both companies. It's, it's very possible. But it'll be a long time before anybody beats the performance of this card, I can tell you that much. So <laughs> and such wonderful fan designs. Actually, <laughs> fan design, and that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. I'm actually uh, not going to be on Monday's episode of TechZilla. Robert Heron's going to be co-hosting for me. Okay. Uh, I, I am going to be on the vacation. And uh, mostly stripping lead paint out of the house because, you know, that's the way I roll. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, excuse me, uh, lead abatement, I think, actually, is the word I'm supposed to be using for that. And, yes, I will be wearing appropriate safety equipment and following all of the rules uh, that the EPA has laid down for not poisoning myself or others with lead paint or lead paint residue or lead paint dust. Good, now good. That I've talked about lead abatement. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be, I, I think I'm actually have the Pioneer App Radio review done for Wednesday's Techzilla, and I'm also working on a, because uh, I've gotten a lot of questions recently about now that the, the Logitech review has dropped down to $99, how do we feel about how that compares to the Roku 2 and uh, the Apple TV and, of course, the Boxy Box, and there are about 3,000 other options out there, so... I've been trying to figure out a way to talk about all of the major features from these and, and also kind of hoping that, you know, Google suddenly releases a, a massive Google TV upgrade. Because I know as soon as, if I don't wait for Google to do the massive upgrade, they will release it like the day uh, the review <laughs> hit the street. <laughs> so okay, little, yeah. You know what I mean? You, you've had the, 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 I'm sure that you've had that, that, that moment where you're like, really? You announced that today? You could have announced that yesterday and I could have rewritten the article then. I have a lot of those, yes. <laughs> The pain, the agony, the <laughs> hardware people. That's what we bring to you every week on Twitch. <laughs> Twitch at twitch.tv. Uh, that's the one way to get a hold of Ryan and myself. Or you can mm -hmm. hit us on the Twitter at Ryan Shrout and at Patrick Norton. Uh, thanks, to everybody, for listening to the show. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Hey, I'm glad you brought your mic with you at least. Eh? Hey, you, have, have you seen the exciting mic stand I put together? Because I don't have uh, my mic stand with me. I, heard, I saw your tweet about it. With oh, yeah. uh, That's actually pretty impressive. I'm not going to lie. Parachute cord, baby, for the win. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> but you always travel with parachute cord. You never know when it will come in useful. <clears throat>